The Tom Woods Show, episode 817. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're concerned that Donald Trump may be a bad president, well, I got good news for you. They've all been terrible. Check out our free course on the real history of the U.S. presidents and their crimes against liberty over at freehistorycourse.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here talking to Jeb Kinnison, who is author of an interesting new book called Death by HR, How Affirmative Action Cripples Organizations. Now, I know I've got maybe 17 to 20 percent of my listeners being out of the United States. So just in case HR isn't something you know, or I, I don't know if this is a common thing in other countries, or if you would know the translation or whatever, but HR just stands for Human Resources Department. So it oversees employment and uh, complying with labor law and administering benefits and hiring and dismissal and things like that. And Jeb has written a very interesting and cutting incisive book about what's really going on in HR departments in companies across the country. Jeb Kinnison is a computer programmer and software engineer. He studied astronomy and computer and cognitive science at MIT. He's written several books, a couple on relationships, others in the science fiction genre, and now Death by HR, a very interesting book indeed. Jeb Kinnison, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. That is such a great title, Death by HR. How could you not love that? That's beautiful, beautiful. If you thought that up yourself, then you are absolutely top-notch. That's the kind of title the publisher would recommend to me, and I would, after the fact, know it was good, but I would never have been able to come up with. So good for you. Well, I was I was worried that it might be too uh, extreme or push the point too hard. But it turns out there's widespread resentment against HR departments uh, throughout our society, essentially. Anyone who tries to get something done inside a company and runs into HR as a roadblock uh, resents the way that they have power over their activities. Let's start right from the beginning. How it is that somebody like you, who's not in HR, would be so interested in it? There's a particular episode in your life that occurred that got you thinking, and I think we ought to start there. Oh, okay. Um, I was going for a mortgage a few years ago. It was about 2012. And of course, it was the, the, the entire industry had been bombed out by the, uh, the 2008 recession and the uh, uh, prime mortgages problem and all of that. Um, so talking to Chase Bank, one of the biggest banks that does mortgages, uh, I had a friend who I thought would be helpful in getting me a mortgage. And it turned out to be the worst possible decision uh, because they were unable to deal with uh, the situation except for their mainstream clients. Uh, so I ended up getting the mortgage finally after a great deal of work going to different parts of the country to talk to the uh, the uh, the uh, branches that were dealing with it because they had scattered it all throughout the country. So I had to get on the phone many times with many different people to get the mortgage to actually happen. Uh, and finally, I ended up with the executive ombudsman's office essentially helping me to get it to happen. And it finally did happen. Uh, and after all of that, Several days after the mortgage had closed, uh, I got a letter uh, asking me to prove that it, the property was insured. Again, it had just been proved. It had just been sold to Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae had accepted it. There was no point to providing additional proof, but their process required that. Uh, so <clears throat> I ended up in a meeting with the ombudsman and a vice president in their servicing division, uh, who was a woman with a sort of uncultured accent. Uh, who refused to take a position on whether anything made sense or was logical or not. She said, that's the way we do it, and I'm sorry that you're upset, but you're going to have to provide proof or we can't uh, can't continue to deal with your mortgage. We'll have insurance uh, produced for you. You'll have to pay for it. It'll cost three or four times as much. And I said, what? <laughs> I have to jump through this hoop after I've jumped through so many hoops? And uh, it, it, it turned out this was evidence of what I'd already observed in other large bureaucracies, that people had been moved to positions beyond their level of competence. Uh, she was not able to understand the reason for any of the rules or to uh, waive them under obviously different circumstances where they didn't apply. Uh, or even to acknowledge with you on a human level that something is screwy here. Right. 
Normally, when you're talking to someone like this, they'll say, I know this doesn't make sense. Right. That's all I'm looking for. <laughs> and she wouldn't do that. And I thought, what? That's really odd. Uh, and, and I'd seen this kind of behavior from other bureaucrats before. Uh, a thoughtful bureaucrat understands that their rules are not perfect and there are reasons why they would want to get around them once in a while. She was not thoughtful at all. And how did she get to this position where she could essentially insult a customer, tell the customer they had no uh, reason to feel the way they felt, and attempt to get the customer to do exactly what she said, almost like a government would? And it occurred to me that the banking industry wasn't really a private industry anymore. It was a government-run, regulated entity uh, that served only the masters in government and not the not their customers anymore. Uh, so I wanted to investigate why that was the case and how did that happen. And of course, I, I'd seen HR activities for many years and discuss, and like everyone else in Silicon Valley thought that they were kind of useless people who were getting in the way most of the time. Uh, but how did it happen that they ended up that way? Uh, so I started to investigate and look through the history of it. And there's an overall pattern which you begin to see after a while that the, the HR people are implementing government regulations protecting the enterprise, but they start to act for the government inside companies, uh, promoting the government's line on every issue. Uh, instead of protecting the company, they force the company to uh, tow the government line. Yeah. Now, that's that's what I want to talk about. So first of all, you you go into the origins of HR, if I'm remembering correctly. First of all, it sounds like something that would go back in at least its basics to the progressive era, the idea that we're going to scientifically manage different aspects of society, including hiring. But the really important thing about HR is how it's come to adopt what I think you've called a social work model. You could imagine HR being all about trying to bring people into the firm who are going to maximize value for the firm, be a good fit for the internal culture of the firm, and just, just work out, be somebody that people could stand to have as a colleague for 30 years. All these factors would come together and you'd get your ideal candidate. Instead, that doesn't seem to be exactly what HR people are being trained to look for. Well, that's right. And, and there are now programs uh, in HR specifically. So you get many young people uh, who've never worked a job in their life, really, that had to do with producing anything, uh, going through a college and taking an HR program to be certified as an HR professional. And what they're trained on is essentially labor law, progressive ideals of, of uh, how labor should be treated, minimum wages are all good things. Uh, they don't understand accounting, business, profits, uh, creativity, growth, the things that make the business work, that, that make it successful, are not part of their curriculum. And they, and they come out thinking in terms of uplifting the social views of their fellow employees and making it a happy workplace where everyone respects each other, uh, which is not necessarily what you want in your workplace. If, if you're trying to uh, solve new and different problems, you need a diversity of thought. You need people contending over what the right thing to do is. So they'll explore the problem space and, and discover the new ways of doing things that will make the business successful. If everyone is trained to be nice to each other and uh, constantly agree and see anything external as being dangerous, they won't take the risk necessary to do something new and, and to, to go out into the unknown. And that's one of the biggest problems that we have in, te in technology in, in Silicon Valley with HR attitudes uh, trying to reduce or eliminate new thinking. I, I want to talk about one of the key ingredients, not the only, but a key ingredient in what has made HR so frustrating, not only for, frustrating for everybody, frustrating for applicants, mm -hmm. frustrating for other employees, frustrating for people who run the firm. It's almost, it's, it's like it's become some kind of a fiefdom within the firm. In fact, let's, let's talk about that. Well, yes, this problem is you're running a big business, say you're a factory uh, in 19, the 1920s when this was becoming really a, a large issue, uh, when HR was beginning to be developed to protect or defend the business against government uh, regulations and against uh, lawsuits from employees. You hire a, a group of people to uh, try to tell your managers how to operate in a way that won't cause problems. And eventually those people have do have a little fiefdom of their own. Uh, they begin to identify more with the progressives who are issuing all the regulations and all the labor requirements uh, and less with the success of the business. Meanwhile, you as the 
executive who's trying to run the operation have put them there as a buffer. So you try to ignore them as <laughs> you don't pay a lot of attention to what they tell you because they're just there to keep other people from bothering you. Uh, and, and over time, the uncontrolled growth of HR departments uh, ends up creating a, uh, an area within the company that has a different philosophy, has a different, uh, a different culture than the rest of your company. If you're not really careful in controlling that, you're going to end up with people who are anti what you want your company to do. So, well, let's think about the sorts of things that an HR department might want to do that seem to them to make sense according to everything they learned in school. Of course we should want this. We should want to, uh, to help to uplift people and we should want to help to bring diversity to the workforce and, and this and that. And it it turns out that actually in the workforce, what you really want are just people who are really competent. It, it actually turns out that that's what you want. Well, and, and people who are really competent respect each other and, and they're not likely to uh, – look down on someone because of their color or sex, if as long as they're competent, as they're carrying their share of the load, the job is getting done, everyone feels good about everyone else, that's great. That's not actually what happens because uh, the HR department has encouraged greater diversity, meaning people who weren't quite as competent are brought in instead of someone else. Uh, and you get the phenomenon of the diversity higher, someone who is hired largely for their diversity component and not because of their competence, people start to joke about that. And uh, after, after considering that uh, someone who is a minority or, or a woman might be less competent simply because they are, uh, you, you get a reputational issue. So everyone in the company who is a minority or woman gets labeled, oh, well, you were only hired because you're one of those. Uh, and this is a negative problem. I mean, it creates conflict in the workplace because no longer is the standard simply being competent and carrying your own weight. It's the fact that you were a representative of a group that we decided to increase in this company. Uh, I've read many HR people who are really proud because they forced the hiring of many more women and minorities in the company. And now the percentage is way up and they're happy. And they've, they've converted some of the managers to see that as the right thing uh, because their view of employees is that they can be groomed and managed to be excellent no matter who they are. It's, it's like no child left behind applied to uh, employment. Uh, you, you think the organization is so good that you can bring people in and make them creative and change their characteristics so that they will be a great part of the team. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> people do have characteristics that are, are difficult to change and they can't be necessarily brought up to the standards of everyone else simply by being kind to them and, and promoting uh, documentation that shows how accepting your organization is. Uh, there's a lot of cultural factors. There's a lot of uh, ability and aptitude act factors that are, are critical. And uh, this, this progressive view that people can be groomed to be anything they want to be is simply wrong. And we in the technology industry know that. We, we've tried as hard as we can to, to get women to program. And many good women programmers are there and, and participating, but there's a limit. You, there's only so far that you can go beating the bushes for new women programmers. Uh, if you bring people in who are not capable, you're not doing them any favors. They begin to feel like they're not pulling their own weight. Other people look down on them. Uh, and eventually they give up and leave the industry. And that's happening now because the, the efforts uh, are so large that we're pulling in people who aren't all that motivated. Yeah. Now, let's let, let's talk about uh, I, I want to talk further about the racial element, particular with regard to Silicon Valley, which you mentioned in the book. Yeah. So there you've got a case where 30 percent of the people working in Silicon Valley in, in these uh, tech companies are Asian, 30 percent, right. which is huge, huge, vastly out of proportion to their representation in the population, uh, about 60 percent white. Which is, I guess, which is underrepresented, if you want to put it that way. Exactly. And so, so you would say, if if you had no axe to grind, if you were from Mars and just looking at this dispassionately, you'd say, "Wow, okay, I guess by that definition, that's a reasonably diverse field." But no, you would be told, "No, it's not," even though it obviously is. But it's just because the the groups that the pressure groups want to see in there aren't the ones in there. Now, by the way, I could easily imagine. 
if Asians were not represented well in Silicon Valley and Asians didn't have this model minority reputation, I could easily imagine the excuse factory jumping into into play and saying, well, of course, they're not going to do well on the West Coast with the history of discrimination and the internment camps during World War II and the segregated schools around the turn of the century. Of course, they're going to do badly. But the thing is, they did have all those obstacles and they're doing great. So therefore, we hear not a word about any of that, not a word about their struggle or their obstacles because they overcame them. And we all know in this world, nobody overcomes anything without a government program. Well, it, it proves itself. They must have been privileged because they did well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't argue with these people. Exactly. Well, uh, Jesse Jackson, like a good example of a pressure group politician, uh, he comes in and says, oh, we need more representation of black people in, in all of your companies that are making lots of money because we need to make money, too. Uh, and, and in so doing, he uh, essentially extorts funding for his organizations from large businesses. And uh, one of the responses from uh, Silicon Valley has been to bow down and say, yes, yes, we'll do everything we can. Uh, and they will uh, appoint a, a vice president of diversity or head of diversity. Uh, someone whose sole job is to get diversity up in the organization. And of course, none of this makes any sense, but p the people who are running the Silicon Valley uh, companies mostly understand that what they're actually doing is just holding these people off, deflecting and avoiding uh, actually doing what they want while saying that they're going to do what they want. Uh, when you have an extortionist, there's only a couple of ways of dealing with them. You throw them a few bones and you do a little bit of what they're asking for, but you can't do it all, otherwise you'd be threatening your company. Uh, the, the particular problem with blacks and Latinos being underrepresented in Silicon Valley has to do with their interest in the subject and uh, their willingness to concentrate and focus on something mathematical, logical. Uh, programming is an interesting skill and it involves trying to block out the rest of the world while you do these log logical and rational things to imagine what the computer is going to do. Uh, and this is not something that most women and minorities really feel like doing because they're more interested in the, 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 the culture and the social world, and especially in women's case, the encouragement of nurturance and the togetherness that they enjoy. They enjoy social activities, and programming is essentially a, a, an isolating activity. I would be willing to bet – now, I haven't looked into any of the numbers, but I'd be willing to bet that actually, by any reasonable standard, I would be willing to bet that women and blacks and Hispanics are actually, if we understand the word correctly, overrepresented in Silicon Valley if we say we're going to measure it according to the – indication of interest in the field by virtue of having a degree in the relevant subject. If we – instead of just looking at blacks as a group and saying, well, gee, they're 12 to 14 percent of the population, they ought to be 12 to 14 percent in Silicon Valley. Well, how many of them percentage-wise have degrees in anything having to do with computers then see how they are in Silicon Valley? And I bet it would turn out OK. I mean that, that's my hypothesis. I think you're probably right. And uh, if you look at people in advanced PhD programs in the kind of subjects that end up doing technology, uh, there are very few blacks and Latinos because they're just not that interested in the topic. But companies will end up hiring a large number of them in subsidiary functions. Uh, for example, HR. HR is, is, tends to be top heavy with, with uh, women, minorities and uh, people who are interested in social justice. Uh, which is part of the problem. Because they're so interested, they want to tell other people what to do. Um, and the uh, Silicon Valley companies have tended to hire more of the minorities in those subsidiary areas because they're not critical. They're not part of the flow of getting the product out. Uh, and so they can make their EEOC numbers look better by hiring additional numbers of people that they don't consider to be uh, as critical or as important in minorities. Uh, and this causes a cultural divide between the side of the company that is actually producing the product and the, the subsidiary functions like accounting and uh, HR and uh, some kinds of uh, service functions. And so you, you see that issue between those two sides. They don't respect each other. They don't believe each other have the right uh, attitude toward things. And it causes problems within the organization unless the executive level is very careful to set the culture as being one of uh, accomplishment. I want to return to something you said briefly about Jesse Jackson because I – first of all, Jesse Jackson is a bit uh, 
kind of passe these days, but I grew up with him. You know, in the 1980s, everybody knew he ran for president. Everybody knew who Jesse Jackson was. And it really is true what you're saying. He he goes around and shakes down companies, knowing perfectly well it is impossible for them to meet his demands. It can't be done. Right. So therefore, he makes impossible demands, knowing that he can destroy your reputation. Here we are supposedly living in a if, – if we live, really lived in a country of white privilege, any white-dominated company could tell Jesse Jackson to you know, go jump in a lake, but they don't dare. Instead, what they do is when he says to them, well, what would you like to donate to our annual banquet this year? They make a vastly disproportionate donation to that banquet. I mean <laughs> an amount of money that makes no sense for a banquet, they go ahead and give it. I don't think – there are a lot of people, even my listeners who are not naive, I don't think they realize – this goes on. And the, the legal environment under which we all operate practically compels this. Well, and yeah, you've paid off the Dane. The, the, the Dane Geld uh, keeps him off right now, but it keeps them alive to come back and ask for more and more and more. And we've empowered these people to uh, take the moral high ground, so they think, and uh, given them the resources to, to produce more and more of themselves. Uh, this becomes an issue because they're basically parasites living on the hard work of others. Uh, and, and you want to do something to stop that without looking like the bad person. Uh, we have a problem in that the, the people who want to do the right thing are easily persuaded to go along with these ideas. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with diversity per se. We, we want people of various characters and kinds and religions and ethnicities to all cooperate together and, and sing Kubaya. But doing that by group identification, by saying that these classes will get some better treatment than these other classes, is, is not helpful. I mean, you have, uh, you have people who are uh, dark skinned, who basically have been brought up in upper middle or upper class environments and had private educations like President Obama. Uh, and, and really never suffered anything in their life that would have been considered a, a deprivation. And yet they get special treatment and are encouraged to uh, apply to the best schools because those schools want their colored skin. Uh, this means that what we tried to do, which was take people who are disadvantaged, who actually did not have the opportunity to achieve what others have had, uh, but we think they have the potential. So we want to give them an opportunity to show their potential. But when we set up these sets of rules, they tend to be gamed. So Harvard is an institution has gamed the rules so that it basically swallows a large number of the very best minority candidates, the people who have been brought up with lots of educational opportunities, who've been to Europe, who have uh, high level educations already. Uh, and, of course, those people do very well. And it's not fair to some poor white person from Appalachia who did not have these opportunities uh, not to have the place that was taken by someone uh, who's basically a, a child of uh, African diplomats who grew up in the United States and went to, uh, went to uh, private schools. Uh, yet our system is set up that way. No one examines it to, to see if uh, affirmative action is actually doing good. It's doing more harm than good. And many of us know that, but yet it cannot be stopped because there's too many people who depend on it to act the way that it does. And they defend it because they were beneficiaries themselves. I want to ask you about performance evaluations that I guess HR carries out. Uh -huh. What's the problem here? This, this is not a, an affirmative action question. Is there – what's the – why would people be upset about that? Is, I mean we all – if you feel like you're being fairly evaluated, nobody really should resent that. So what's, <laughs> what's being done wrong with that? Well, uh, who is doing the evaluation and what's the purpose? Well, the purpose is to defend the company against lawsuits primarily. Uh, because of that external legal environment and political environment with the labor laws and so forth, uh, it, if a company fires someone, there are any number of uh, characteristics about that person that they can claim that they were being discriminated against. Their firing was uh, immoral or incorrect, and they can file a lawsuit for hundreds of thousands of dollars against the company. And so performance evaluations, it's partly an effort uh, by the company to determine who deserves to be promoted and who should go up and by looking at everyone else's evaluation of them. Uh, but it's mostly about establishing a record so that you can eliminate people that you think are the worst performance uh, performers uh, without running into a lawsuit issue. So after several negative evaluations, which are done by this long and complicated process, you have a record showing that, oh, well, we've decided this is not a good employee, and so we fired them because of that, not because of their skin color or age or whatever. Um, 
that the objection is primarily that it takes so much time. You, you've taken the decisions out of the hands of managers who uh, understand what their, their team members have done and can easily uh, figure out how to reward them properly without the help of all of this uh, performance evaluation. But because of the legal environment, uh, all of the employees, the managers, and everyone else spends a great deal of time going through the motions of evaluating each individual employee. And then they get down to the meeting where they're deciding what to do about them. Uh, the manager essentially games the system to get what they wanted in the first place. And so the entire exercise is a waste of everyone's time. No one enjoys it. And just like deciding on salaries every year or budgets every year, it, it's a huge part of a manager's job to spend this time doing performance evaluations. Companies that have experimented with eliminating them entirely and just letting the manager do what they think is right for their employees and for the company discover that the result is just as good and no one has to spend the time on it. <laughs> Uh, and, and so the, the problem is the lawsuits. Uh, right. So, in fact, the real problem then behind all this is the government. It's not like this, although I have no reason to doubt that a lot of corporate CEOs do have some left wing cultural attachments all the same. Mm -hmm. This is not a spontaneously occurring phenomenon in, in the business world. Right. Well, now, look, there's got to be a way if these HR departments – are doing such a terrible job, there's got to be a way to do an end run around them. I mean, it's your own company, right? If, I, if I'm running a company and I've got some department that keeps bringing me terrible candidates, isn't there some way I can disrupt this or intervene? Exactly. Of course there is. And the, the reason why that it doesn't happen very often is that uh, it's a long-term thing. The H HR department is there. It exists. It does what it's doing. If you want to change it, it's going to be a lot of work it's going to be a lot of political trouble with people within the company. And uh, why would you do that when everything seems to be working and it's fine? Uh, well, the, the answer is if you don't do it in the long run, your company will be hobbled. Uh, it's best if, if you start out with an HR head when you're growing as a company uh, who has the attitude of getting the business going and uh, reflects that in all the people that he hires. So your HR department is not your internal enemy. That's the best thing. But if you're coming in uh, to a large organization and you discover that HR is uh, about a uh, social justice warrior happy talk and they're trying to make a, a social culture camp out of it, um, you need to do something. And, and you do that by uh, uh, changing your head of HR, giving that person the mission of setting a new culture for your HR and uh, uh, working hard to uh, keep people who've been programmed by labor activists and uh, 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 diversity activists from being important. Uh, that, of course, is difficult. You will get a bad reputation. Uh, what was his name? T.J. Rogers at Cypress Semiconductor is a fine example of someone in the 80s and 90s who resisted uh, these efforts to uh, make social justice the thing. Uh, and, of course, he got a reputation for it. <laughs> he went really public with it and... Uh, uh, it's one of the things you can do is to uh, be a hard nosed, hard ass about certain things and just take your ground and don't try to deflect and don't try to defend yourself from these accusations. Just say, this is what it is. We're a company that's trying to make money, doing great products for people. We do more good in the world by doing that than by uh, uh, grooming our employees and, and making it a, a great place to work that people are happy with, but they don't actually work very hard. Um, if you get that reputation, you will be attracting the kind of employees you want. It just seems like it's a risky prospect because it's so unfashionable to say those things. Right. And you will get into political trouble. You will be attacked externally. Uh, because I want the very best people. You know, I forget who it was, but you've got a lengthy quotation in the book from somebody who was defending his company against a group of left wing nuns yes. who wanted more diversity. And he just eviscerated this and said, Look, that was DJ Rogers. Yes, oh, oh, was it? oh, it was the same guy. All right. So then, OK, so that you picked the perfect person because, yeah, he basically said, look, there there aren't women who are trained. I mean, here are the qualifications these jobs need. He says now. Normally, this yields me a guy in his 50s who's white. Now, that's because, you know, 30 years ago, we didn't have as many other people in school for these sorts of things. Maybe that'll change. The point is, right now, th these are the cards I'm dealt. Right. There's no other way I can remotely run this company. And moreover, given that people's retirements depends on the value of our stock, 
If you really tell me that you care about the welfare of human beings, I really don't believe you because you're going to make our stock go way down, which is going to hurt the retirement portfolios of a whole lot of people. So in effect, he was basically saying, go shut your mouths and stop talking about stuff you know nothing about. Well, unlike a lot of political government efforts, you can identify a, a small group of people who will benefit a great deal from your proposed new program. Uh, and that would be the people who've uh, been affirmatively applied or actually acted into jobs. Uh, those nuns wanted uh, at a time where there were very few women in the industry at all. Uh, they wanted the board of directors to be half women. Uh, this was basically an idea that was coming into play in Norway and places like that. And uh, so they naturally were pushing for the same thing, even though there's no pipeline. Uh, as T.J. Rogers said, maybe someday there will be a lot of women who have the kind of experience and training and interest necessary that we could uh, appoint them uh, to our board. But right now, that's not even possible. If, if I appoint a bunch of board members who don't understand my business, uh, I'm going to hurt my business and hurt the people who invest in me and hurt everyone, including all of the employees, uh, because we won't be doing as well. and We'll have to start laying them off. Um, if you try to micromanage someone else's business because you have certain social justice principles, you're actually creating great harm. You're, you're creating a Soviet Union where uh, people are given jobs, they pretend to work, they pretend to be paid, they have no choice in life because someone has decided for them almost everything that they do. I want to mention very quickly the points you make about doesn't diversity help companies and aren't there studies that show that diversity has been a net benefit? And even without looking into the details of these studies, I just knew because I've been on this earth for 44 years and I know how these people operate, that the studies were probably very weak right. or didn't really show this or there were countervailing studies or the sort of people who would even do such a study would be people looking for a particular outcome. Somebody who wants to say diversity doesn't really help, where's he going to get the grant money for that study? Exactly. I mean, it just has it just has academic malpractice written all over because it just runs contrary to everything you would think. How could hiring somebody on a basis other than what's best for the culture of the company be best for the company? Well, exactly. And this is a problem we have with social science research in general. It's funded for political reasons uh, and done by mostly left wing professors who want to prove certain points that will support progressive goals in the future. And it's exactly what happened with these studies. They're relatively small, they're relatively weak, uh, they're not scientific, and they were picked up and promoted by huge numbers of people in the media because they uh, uh, promote the narrative, uh, which is what is required to get diversity to be valued above productivity and everything else. Um, What's interesting about that, it's, it's, it's like the left-wing version of uh, truthiness or fake news. Uh, we get this throughout our society, people uh, accepting and believing uh, the common wisdom, which came out of what you might call cultural Marxist promotion. I mean, that's what's going on, really, uh, is that these academics and people who are not in business at all want to affect and change society in ways that – they feel emotionally are important, and they do that by pretending to be scientists, by pretending to do studies because we respect science, because science, the label of science and a study and uh, academic who's neutral and all of that uh, gives something a great deal of impetus. Uh, the actual, uh, the woman that I quote in the book traced the, the studies and how they were cited and repeated over and over again until they became truth. Uh, with less and less of the caveats that the original academics might have put into the study, it's now suddenly true that, well, every company does better if it has a more, di more diverse workforce. Uh, and you will find no one who disagrees with that, or almost no one out in the, uh, out in the uh, business world, because it's not allowed to disagree with that position, because we have political correctness running the show. Yeah, and of course that would open up a whole other question. Is political correctness an outgrowth of government policy or is it driving government policy such that if we – even if we got rid of the government policy, we'd still have people pushing this sort of stuff? That's that's something to chew on. If people want to follow your work, to give us the website. Uh, that would be jebkinnison.com. All right, jebkinnison.com, K-I-N-N-I-S-O-N.com. I'm going to link to that at tomwoods.com slash 817. And, of course, Death by HR, How Affirmative Action Cripples Organizations. That's also available. Obviously, you can get that on Amazon. I'm going to link to that also at tomwoods.com slash 817. Very interesting. You've written on such a variety of topics that 
when somebody sent me death by HR and then I went to look at your background, I didn't believe it was the same person. And then I read your stuff and you know, you know, you're you're citing the foundation for economic education and all these different sorts of places. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, how about that? This guy is one of us. <laughs> I am one of you. Yes. <laughs> um, the next book is going to be about uh, one of the key points. In the next book is going to be about defunding all of the people who do these things, who promote this uh, party line. Uh, they're academia, they're in government, uh, we all pay tax dollars. Uh, many of those tax dollars are funded to uh, are, are funneled off to propaganda to influence us to continue to vote for more people who will spend more tax dollars. Uh, and if this new administration does something to reform regulations and reduce the amount of funding that goes to places like NPR and academic studies of social science, which are almost always useless, uh, that would be a great thing. And I, I would totally support that. And the next book will cite many examples and uh, try to get at the topic of people who are making money uh, not by producing good things, but by producing ideas that promote more of themselves. Right. And, and we have uh, quite a few of those. Jeb Kennison, thanks so much for your time. Excellent book. I hope it does very well. Thank you very much. All right. Before I let you go, here is a really, really interesting listener website that was just begun not very long ago. And it is 50 to one blog.com. That's five zero two, then the number one blog.com. So 50 to one blog.com because what he's trying to do is go from the 50th percentile to the first percentile, the number one percentile, in terms of income earning. He says, I'm just a regular guy who's on a mission to become one of the top 1% of income earners. When I began this journey back in 2015, I was smack dab in the middle, the 50th percentile. I'm giving myself three years to accomplish this goal, and on his blog, he's going to be talking about everything he's doing to try to get there. He says the challenge he has is this. He wants to go from making $60,000 a year in 2015 to the top 1% by 2018. Well, it depends on the state you live in, what dollar amount that is. But in his state, it's around $300,000 per year. So he's, he's going to have to multiply his income by five in the next three years. And he's going to talk to you about exactly what he's doing to get there. So that sounds very very interesting to me so you can check it out at 50 to one blog.com I will link to it as the listener website mentioned at tomwoods.com slash 817 remember that I will give your blog a shout out as well plus a SEO juicy link on my website as well as two dozen video tutorials on blogging with WordPress and membership in my private bloggers group if you like as free bonuses when you use my link to get your hosting. Get all the details on how you can get all these goodies at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow I'm talking to that weasel Michael Malice again. This could be the best conversation we've had other than our debate on Alexander Hamilton that we did in New York City where I crushed that little weasel. But this is a great conversation because I come to libertarianism from the Rothbardian side. He comes at it from the Ayn Randian side. And tomorrow we're going to sort that out because he recently read a Rothbard book. He's got a lot to say about it. It's going to be a great, great conversation. Don't miss episode 818. Talk to you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.